Awesome. Okay, great. We're going to get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for making it through the day. It's always the, uh, the 4 p.m. Uh, sessions are the toughest one to get everyone in. And thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start off by doing some introductions from uh, Roger over there. And he can tell you quickly a bit about himself, and we can move back down the panel. So uh, I'm Roger Veer. I'm the CEO of BitcoinStore.com and MemoryDealers.com and an angel investor in a number of Bitcoin startups. Been involved in Bitcoin over two and a half years now and uh, couldn't be more excited to do it. And I'm happy to talk about my experience with international business using Bitcoin. I'm Alan Safahi. I am CEO of ZipZap. We are a global cash payment network. We like to consider ourselves an API for cash. Basically, uh, we would like to see everybody do whatever they can online with cash that they do offline. And we are a partner with uh, BitInstant and other partners that we enable to accept cash online. Uh, we are live in US, Brazil, and Russia. Hi, I'm Bill Barheit, the CEO and founder of Boom Financial. We're the only cross-border mobile banking service operating in the United States today. We provide bank accounts to uh, immigrants uh, from places like Haiti, Mexico, uh, Guatemala, it's, uh, Dominican Republic, and allow them to send money via text message to their family back home and then provide uh, the, sim the same bank accounts to their family back home, obviously uh, in, in their local currency. And then we operate an agent network all around the world in those countries to provide liquidity in and out of the system. I'm Jay Shore. I am CEO of Coinable.com. Uh, we are one of the oldest Bitcoin retailers in existence. I have personally been involved in Bitcoin since early 2011. Uh, what we do is we intake Bitcoins and output precious metals and vice versa. I can vouch for that. He's been here a long time. My name is Charlie Shrem. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of BitInstant, which is a company that allows you to, using ZipZap and some other partners, um, use something like cash or ACH and, and buy Bitcoins um, and actually sell them. So if you have some Bitcoins, you want to put money back into your bank account, we can do it in about 30 minutes. You don't have to wait longer than that. I'm also one of the um, uh, board members and the vice chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation that put on this amazing event. Um, and uh, that's it. Been involved in Bitcoin since early 2011 as well. Great. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Vinny Lingham. I'll be the moderator for today's session. Co-founder and CEO of a mobile app wallet company called Gift. Uh, and we uh, allow you to switch your Bitcoins into gift cards at face value in less than 60 seconds. So you can spend them in 50,000 stores around the country. So um, very passionate about Bitcoins and what it offers us as a, as a mobile company. So th the first question I'm going to pose to the, p the panel is, um, how is, how is Bitcoin going to penetrate and disrupt the international payments market? And, you know, we're talking about remittances, cross-border trade, uh, even things like free on board and, and, and those types of um, uh, mechanisms for making payment and taking risk uh, on cross-border transactions. And I'm going to ask uh, Alan to step up and, and, and take the first... Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Vinny. Basically, the current financial systems are uh, very inadequate. Uh, to say the least. We take people's money and then we tell them where they can spend it or how they can spend it or who they can spend it with. Um, you know, so it's, it's not very consumer friendly. So I think any payment option like Bitcoin or uh, Ripple or other currencies that come out that eliminate the friction in the transaction and whether it's uh, financial friction or time or distance, what, when you reduce friction and you make it more consumer friendly, obviously you will have a chance for success. So I think it's time for uh, people in the payment business to look at this from a consumer perspective and, uh, and to see what the consumers want. And obviously the Bitcoin experiment that Charlie talks about a lot has proven that, you know, that consumers want something easy that you can transfer money very quickly with your phone or your, through the internet within minutes or seconds. So uh, you know, I think that, uh, that, that is, there is definitely opportunity for disruption. Great. Anyone else? I think Bitcoin, um, you have to look at it in two ways, uh, as a currency, but for the sake of this panel, um, as that kind of international payment system, that, that infrastructure of being able to send uh, money around the world. And it has a lot of great utilities. And that's, these utilities will what be, will, these utilities will help Bitcoin get into the mainstream. So you have things like remittance, being able to send money around the world. 
um, micropayments, donations. And we're not talking about America here, we're just talking about you know, the world. And it's, it's taking a, a local currency and making it global, interestingly enough. So, you know, obviously the, the goal of commerce is trying, you know, uh, is trying to reduce, uh, I wouldn't say the goal of commerce, but, you know, in, in trying to grow our businesses, we're trying to reduce friction in doing business. So, uh, and there's obviously risk with cross-border transactions. So, um, how do you see Bitcoin specifically, and I'll give it to Roger, how do you see as, a, as a, an online retailer, uh, Bitcoin changing the way you do business um, versus, you know, taking credit cards? Sure. As, as a merchant who's been accepting credit cards and PayPal on the internet for over a decade now, I can tell you that Bitcoin is just so much more convenient. I can accept a payment from any customer in any country in the world, and I don't have to worry about a chargeback or fraud or any of that sort of stuff. And I don't have to pay any of these fees that are involved with credit cards or PayPal. So as a merchant who's accepting Bitcoins as a payment, I would much, much, much rather that any of my customers pay me in Bitcoins rather than, than credit card. And even if I wasn't someone interested in the technology of Bitcoin, even for normal merchants that don't care about the ramifications that Bitcoin has for the world, Bitcoin's better for them. They don't have to pay the fees and they get the money deposited in their bank account the, right, the very next day if they don't want to hold the Bitcoins and want to convert them back into their local currency. It's mathematically so it's, impossible, right? It's mathematically impossible. <laughs> Um, and then for sending payments, though, too, uh, I've been paying people all over the world for products that I resell. Um, if I use a traditional bank, I have to pay the bank $40 for a wire transfer and wait a couple of days. And if I get one little thing wrong in the address of the bank and fill, when I'm filling out the big giant form, the wire gets lost for two weeks or so until the bank tracks down and figures out what happens with, with Bitcoin. I ask my vendor, what Bitcoin address would you like me to pay you to? And then I send the Bitcoins, and then both myself and my, my vendor can check on the Bitcoin blockchain instantly to make sure that, yes, I have paid him and that the Bitcoins are there. And it's just so much more convenient than banks. And a number of my vendors overseas are now accepting payments in Bitcoin at this point, and they like it because they can see, yeah, Roger did pay. Whereas if I tell them, oh, I sent the wire, Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, and there's not really any way for anybody to check, whereas with Bitcoin, everybody knows right away. So I think the, the vendors and the merchants and the customers, everybody on every side of the transaction will love using Bitcoin compared to the regular payment systems that we've all been using the last decade. So Roger, let me ask you a question. You have, an off, you have offices in, in California, uh, Japan, Korea, and others, I'm sure, and you have factories and distributors in places like Vietnam, China, the whole Pacific and, and Asian rim, right? Um, and you're obviously moving a lot of money every single day between your factories, distributors, your customers, your, your employees. How has Bitcoin changed that? So I don't have quite as many locations <laughs> as Charlie <laughs> mentioned there, but uh, it's incredibly convenient. So one example, uh, I'm involved in BitcoinStore.com full time. Our main programmer is somewhere in Russia. I'm not exactly sure where, but we pay him in Bitcoin. He sends me an email, says, here's how many hours I spent. Here's the Bitcoin address. I send him the Bitcoins. I literally, I don't know what country he's in, but it doesn't matter. I know his Bitcoin address. He gets his payment. I send it to him. Everybody's happy. We have another guy who's in Vietnam. He sends me his Bitcoin address. I send the payment. I don't have to wait for the bank. I don't have to wait for the credit card company. I don't have to wait for anybody. He tells me the Bitcoin address. I send the payment and we're done. Everybody's happy and we don't have to sign any terms of service with a credit card company or with PayPal or with a bank or worry about exchange rates with uh, international currency transfers. It's so much easier. It's so much faster. It's so much more simple. It's just better for everybody on every side of the transaction and it just makes it so convenient to pay people uh -huh. around the world. So Great. we just Sorry. to just yeah. to clarify, we, we actually settle our transactions today in real time for customers in multiple countries. And we have to maintain massive reserve accounts with banks all over the world to do that. Uh, and the cost of cash for us is non-trivial. So people complain about our cost basis for a customer is probably three to three and a half percent today, whereas Western unions globally on average, it's a huge standard deviation, but it's probably, it's not 10 percent, but it's probably about eight and a half percent. Um, and, and so for us, uh, I agree with the UN when they said a few years ago that the dollar is no longer a viable reserve currency, but there's not a viable replacement at this point. So my customer is not interested. If, if my customer living in a tent city in Haiti is really not interested in Bitcoin. They're interested in buying food for their family and surviving for the next 20 days. Um, but if I can get the cost of, of, of maintaining that cash down and lower the overall cost of a transaction amortized down to one and a half percent, that's more money in their pocket. So if I can have a reserve currency that I can manage on a global basis, 
that lowers those money market funds for us by you know 40 basis points or 50 basis points that's going right into the pocket of my customers and that's real and that's tangible and that's going to you know improve the quality of people's lives dramatically they say there's no more powerful force in the world than uh, an idea whose time has come so you know we, we, with that looking forward um who are the losers going to be in the space who are the losers obviously you know the potential winners are companies in this room uh, and in the industry um, but who are the losers? I mean, we're talking about companies like Western Union, Zoom, MoneyGram, potentially PayPal. Uh, should they embrace uh, Bitcoin or should they shun it? Should they try and take a defensive strategy or they, should they go on the offensive? Well, like, seniorage is, is probably the biggest loser, right? I mean, if, if, if the way the, the Treasury makes money, uh, you know, through issuing dollars as a reserve currency is probably uh, the biggest business that's at risk, in my opinion. That doesn't really directly affect uh, any of us, uh, but it certainly affects the the Treasury Department of the United States, right? The issuance of hundred dollar and five hundred dollar bills. Western Union. Um, it, but listen, no, I, I, mean, I don't agree with that. Let, let, let's, They're a no, hundred and sixty five year old company. They can't afford to ignore Bitcoin. So, so uh, I want to try and direct this this part of it. So, let's take the governments out of the equation here, because the governments themselves, you know, we, we can't just talk about the U.S. We have to talk about the entire global sort mm -hmm. of the U.N. all the governments of the world. Let's just take that out from an economic standpoint, looking at the margin changes, the mm -hmm. you know, the, the lower cost of operating businesses, companies with with excessive cost structures that are trying to move money around the world, they're under threat by Bitcoin if it takes off. We mm -hmm. all agree on that point. But so. Who are these companies, and uh, I've mentioned a couple, and wh how should they deal with this problem of Bitcoin being a disruptive force in their industries? You should yeah, call me. <laughs> I see it more I mean, as a debit and credit network. I, 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 I like want to work with them. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to hear from Jay on this. Well, in my opinion, I feel like any of the money transference businesses out there that are currently in existence are going to face the most threat from Bitcoin. Because as a consumer, if you want to make an overseas purchase, you don't want to spend 60, 70, 80 dollars on wire transfer fees. And you don't want to spend 5% on currency conversion fees. So really, it's, it's the consumer that's going to drive this revolution where money transfers are going to have to jump on the bandwagon or else they're just going to be outpriced. So, you know, consumers, I mean, consumers driving it is one thing. I think the, it's difficult for consumers to drive something they don't know about. So they need to, they need to realize and they need to see the benefits that they don't have to give their personal credit card information to some guy in, you know, I'm from South Africa, so I'll use Africa. Uh, some guy in Africa gets to see their, 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 their credit card details on a form they submit, you know, no matter how secure it may be. You just don't know, right? Right. And, and not only is, is it a security concern, but it's also a hassle. Uh, in my particular market, I don't know how many of you in here have actually gone and purchased gold or silver with U.S. dollars. It's very, very difficult. Uh, generally, what you have to do is abide by something called a market loss policy, where you give payment information to whatever retailer you're purchasing from in case you don't send a wire transfer. So you're going to sit there and you're going to put in your credit card, and it's never going to be used. It's just going to be stored in their systems in case you don't fulfill your obligations. Now, with Bitcoin, all of this entanglement goes right out the window. You either send a transaction or you don't send a transaction. And I'm not going to go and debit your Bitcoin address for a lack of funds that you've provided. It's either going to work or it's going to not work. And consumers want something that works. They don't want to have to sit there and input their credit card and then spend $60 sending a wire transfer. So when they, uh, since I work with MoneyGram and other money transfer companies, I can tell you that they're not going to be losers in this. They are all over this thing. And uh, you know, Western Union recently announced that they're uh, talking to a lot of partners about you know, doing uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, they're just going to adapt. They're going to see that the consumers want this, and they're going to adapt. Uh, but let me tell you uh, a story since we're in California near Gold Rush you know, area of Sacramento. In the 1849 area, um, the, there was a rush to, for around the world, people came to California to mine for gold. And this is kind of reminiscent of those days. And you ask who would be the losers or winners. I think if you look back, you don't remember any of the people that were mining for gold, but you remember Levi Strauss and Sears and uh, people that brought, provided the shovels and the, the picks. So ZipZap would be, <laughs> I submit, one of the winners because we provide the tools for people to use this currency and uh, hopefully you know, and many other currencies after. So uh, I think, but, but joke, that's joking aside, I think as far as winners um, and losers, uh, anybody who doesn't adapt will lose. Um, you know, banks uh, could potentially be selling Bitcoins like they do any fiat currency in their branches. So they, they need to just adapt to that. I think money transfer companies will adapt. Networks like Visa, MasterCard need to adapt. 
And uh, one last thing I want to point, one point I want to make is um, you see some countries, like, you know, like continents like Africa, where they bypass the whole credit card thing and jump right into mobile payment. You see Saudi Arabia and some of the Middle Eastern countries that bypass the whole landline phone thing and went to mobile. The same thing is going to happen in a lot of countries that are cash-based, because I deal with cash, so I know, you know, Russia, 85% of online transactions are paid with cash offline. In uh, Brazil, it's a large number of cash transactions are made. So a lot of these companies, rather than adapting to the credit card network, could potentially jump past that and go right into Bitcoin. So there is a potential opportunity for disruption in those countries, which is why Charlie and I work very aggressively to expand worldwide in those markets for, for people to buy Bitcoins and pay with cash. The number of hands in the interchange pie is silly. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's that's clearly ripe for disruption. I mean, it works. Most people, most merchants are, are fine to pay the, the fee, but uh, well, no, they're not actually. Well, in a, in a, they in a suck it up and they pay the fee, but but um, there's a reason why they do that, right? Why so so then it. now we're talking about Visa, Mastercard, MX, Discover. Mm -hmm. What's their response going to be to to bitcoins? Are they going to sort of you know take more of the interchange and, and donate it to super PACs and lobbyists and try to stop Bitcoin from getting speed? You know, like. How, how, how is this going to play out? Hmm. There's a couple of perspectives. One is, it's, it's from their perspective, it's just another currency, and the banks are ultimately maintaining stored value, so you're basically just issuing you know, on behalf of the banks, and, and the networks don't change. But then the other perspective you know, is... You know, it's bullshit, right? Well, I'm just giving you their perspective. Excuse, excuse my French. I, I'm not a paid spokesperson for Visa, but I'm pretty sure I know how they would answer that if they were here today um, as a Visa issuer as well. I, uh, I'm pretty sure I know how they, they're thinking about this. But the other opportunity, of course, is disintermediation. And I think that's really interesting, right? Because there's no reason why you know a bank can't issue an account uh, that would allow you know multi-party settlement uh, you know to happen in real time. The challenge, of course, is things like chargebacks um, and who's accepting risk. You know, it's it's a very. I mean, we maintain a staff just dealing with chargebacks on our U.S. accounts, and it's a non-trivial. The laws are are are, are even vague on this. So, so you know, it's it's not something that you can just basically turn off. And yeah. all of a sudden, issue uh, you know public addresses for to accept uh, you know to accept. No, 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 fair enough. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this to, to Roger. I want to get more of an e-commerce spin on it right now. We're in the heart of Silicon Valley. You know, thousands of e-commerce companies out here, and you know, and obviously LA is down. They they're pretty much the LA, New York as well. So, what does this mean for? for e-commerce companies because you know my experience in the past and from my business we don't well we didn't we're not really selling gift cards to people in for example Nigeria or South Africa just because of the risk they could buy an Amazon card it could be a stolen credit card they give a charge back to us we don't just lose the the couple of points margin we make we make lose the whole transaction very very costly very high risk transactions so typically and those and those countries don't support CVV numbers they don't support uh, you know AVS on the back end for the credit card so you can't verify these cards actually work so typically the approach is you know let's just not sell these cards for our, in our case these cards and I know e-commerce companies they're not shipping things outside the US very easily unless they've got a guaranteed form of payment PayPal helps with that to an extent um, Bitcoin changes all that because now it's going to basically blow open the whole global e-commerce market you know is that is that a fair statement do you think that's gonna you know from what you see in your business is that is that happening sure there, there's actually two ways in which it's blowing open the whole worldwide e-commerce market so uh, I remember when I first started selling things on the internet it was really difficult this was before PayPal and it was really difficult to be able to accept credit cards you had to pay well over a thousand dollars for a merchant account and it was a huge headache, especially as you know, a young person trying to start a business. That's a huge, huge expense to get started. Whereas now with Bitcoin, spend about 30 seconds and you can download the Bitcoin software and be up and accepting payments from anyone anywhere in the world. And the other problem that Vinny addressed is you can't accept credit card payments from Nigeria or Indonesia or all sorts of countries because not because you know for sure that the person there is dishonest, but just because there's too much risk that the person's going to be dishonest. Whereas now, with Bitcoin, if you have an online website selling something, you can accept payment from anyone in any country in the world with no risk of fraud. And that's never existed before until Bitcoin. And so it's going to change it in both those ways. It makes it, one, it makes it incredibly easy for anyone to start a business in just a matter of minutes without having to ask permission from anybody. And number two, you can accept payments from anyone anywhere in the world with no risk of fraud. So that's gonna change a tr just an incredible how much easier it is to make it for anyone to start a business on the internet. And that's a great thing, and it's gonna drive a lot of additional commerce. 
The, the demand for goods and services, uh, you know, again, as from being in South Africa, we have a 20% uh, uh, premium on import duties, but goods and services from the U.S. and the rest of the world typically trade at two times the price that it costs uh, in the U.S. So if you want to buy whatever, a, let's just say, for example, an electronic device which would cost $200 a year, you're literally paying 400 bucks back home for that. And that's because of all these, these issues here. So now, you know, we, and when you look at countries like Nigeria, for example, where there's 125 million people, not all of them are doing 419 scams, I can promise you that now. So there, there's a lot of genuine commerce happening there and people trying to do business. But, but the, the mindset so far has been in the U.S. to an extent, and, and particularly Silicon Valley is, and it's fair, the risks of sending goods and services to those countries, even though the demand is there, is just too high. So let's let the aftermarket guys import, pay us wholesale, mark it up by double, and, let's, you know, and, and those consumer markets haven't been tapped into, Indonesia, Philippines, etc. So Bitcoin now, in terms of opening up cross-border trade, is, is going to change and impact a lot of industries, from the shipping, freight industries, to you know, <laughs> pretty much everything in the value chain. And there is going to be uproar around this. So the next question is, I, I suppose, um, you know, what, what are the uh, regulations that we expect to see coming out for around Bitcoin? And, and then to top that off, um, you know, how do we also drive last mile adoption of, of, of Bitcoin in these countries? Because sort of our side of, as Bitcoin enthusiasts, we want this to happen. And but what's going to, you know, it's like it's a game of chess. How are we going to play? It? How's it going to play out? And Charlie, your uh, Bo, you, either of you? I think, uh, I was, like I said before, as utility, you have to sh show someone why they would want to use Bitcoin. But like Bill said, someone in a tent city in Haiti doesn't care about that. He wants, or she wants to be able to get money um, to feed their family. But at the same time, if you can show them that by using Bitcoin, um, it'll save them a lot of money, it'll be safer, it'll be more reliable. Um, and then if that person in Haiti has a family member in New York, and now the, the, the family member in New York can, can send 10% more money a week because they're not paying crazy fees, the family member in Haiti is going to say, wow, this Bitcoin thing is amazing. And then they'll send it to their friend in the UK or their other family member in the UK, and that's going to drive mass adoption. Of course, it's a big chicken and the egg problem. Um, but I think if you asked me like two years ago, how are we going to get that problem? I would say, I don't know, it's going to be very difficult. But look here, we're in this huge conference with all these people and everyone has been hearing about Bitcoin in the past few months and, and we're going really, really quickly and growing super rapidly. Great. Jay? Now, I think we're going to see a lot of regulation come into play in the next few years in terms of cash transaction reporting type activities. So if you're currently doing a lot of business with cash, uh, you are bound by certain transactional reporting requirements that make sure that you are not operating as a money laundering front. And that is one of the primary concerns, in, in my eyes at least, when I see regulators looking at Bitcoin. Uh, I, I see various regulators and various entities out there like FinCEN that use things like the BSA to kind of interpret Bitcoin and what it is and how it works. And for right now, uh, the closest and analogous material we have to Bitcoin is cash. So I think we're going to see a lot of cash-related legislation like we already have in existence. So transactions over $10,000, mm -hmm. uh, multiple transactions over $1,000 in the same day and things like that. Uh, basically, guidelines are going to come out and, and start being enacted for Bitcoin merchants and processors. We're already seeing that happen with the FinCEN guidance a few weeks ago on Bitcoin. Right. Exactly like you said, you have, you know, they even labeled Bitcoin businesses as not only money service businesses, but money transmitter companies. Exactly. And that requires huge licensing burdens, like over five million dollars in bonds and licenses in forty-eight states. Right. That's that's pushing that's pushing down innovation, not just in the Bitcoin space, but in, in any financial or payment company in the country. Yeah, absolutely. And while it, it it does create some issues for various industries, once you learn to actually follow those guidelines and work within those rules, it makes your life a lot easier because it just becomes force of habit. You know what you're supposed to do and you know that you're not breaking the law. Right now, we don't really have any of that guidance and the government agencies that are in charge of this sort of thing are still making up their minds. Um, I think on purpose though, they're waiting. They want to see how it plays out. They want to see how they can come down on us maybe or what they can do. I mean, it's, it's still also very new to them. They don't understand it. They're looking for education, but who's going to walk into a 
Homeland Security office and educate some agents on Bitcoin when they know that they can get stabbed in the back. Right, exactly. And that's why I think we're going to see a lot of the foundation that the government has already created for cash being applied to Bitcoin because they are so similar in so many ways. So I'm going to run a couple, one question through it. I'd like each of you to take a stab at it. Um, and, and then afterwards, I'll open up the floor and get some questions. Um, so I'll start with Roger and we work our way back from there. From what you're seeing in the market right now and the opportunities you're seeing for international trade and commerce, what, what is the thing, you know, if there's some entrepreneurs out there looking for the next big Bitcoin idea, what do you think is, is something which you're seeing and you're seeing some substantive data for that is a very interesting opportunity that you may not pursue in your business? And if you guys can think about that for your respective businesses, take a first go with that. Uh, I'm sorry, the question is... So, so uh, you, you're seeing data, you're seeing people using Bitcoin, you're seeing opportunities, you can't chase down every opportunity in your company. You know, there's certain things you have to do and, and not do. So having said that, what do you think outside of what you're doing right now as a company, where are the big opportunities that you're seeing for Bitcoin entrepreneurs out there to go and start businesses in? I, I think the, the biggest problem with Bitcoin currently is that it's difficult for normal people to buy and then use. So we need all these software developers out there to develop software to make it easier and safe for normal people to buy Bitcoins and then send and receive Bitcoins with other people so that even your grandma can safely send and receive Bitcoins with other people. That's the biggest thing that's missing. That and then the fact that most people haven't even heard of Bitcoin yet. So we need to spread the word about Bitcoin and develop software that makes it easy for people to buy, sell, and use Bitcoins. So that's what we need currently. I agree. Um, the usage is very difficult. I'm an engineer by training and it took me several, Roger and Charlie spent a lot of time training me on it. it. Took me several months to understand how it works. So that's, you know, we shouldn't have to worry about that. It should be plug and play and be able to use it without thinking about it. Um, that's so you, the Netscape moment, right? Yeah. We're looking yeah, for. Yeah. We're, we're all waiting for that Netscape moment Netscape, where, yeah, where exactly. Bitcoin goes from being this sort of you know, this code, which is people don't yeah. understand, to actually being a, a browser. We're close. Yeah, yeah. We're super yeah. close. Well, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so there, you know, I think what happened recently with the value of Bitcoin reaching over a billion dollars, it opened it up to investment community. You see a lot of VCs now all, all of a sudden interested in Bitcoin. And that's the beginning of mainstream, you know, direction for Bitcoin, because as you get investment money into Bitcoin, then you see innovation, creativity, you're going to see, you know, your own interface with GIFT is fantastic. So you're, you're going to see, you know, people coming up with innovations where you can easily um, move money into and out of uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, on Zibza, at Zibza, we try to do that by expanding as quickly as we can, you know, in geographic locations. So we are available for uh, that last mile where, you know, where people want to bring the money into the system. Uh, we are coming up with all sorts of uh, uh, user interface enhancements to make it faster, easier. But uh, generally speaking, I think um, you know, the opportunities lie in uh, tools, you know, going with the, what I said earlier about picks and shovels, you know, whoever is making tools like uh, good wallet, you know, solutions out there, uh, whoever is making uh, good compliance requirements, you know, um, uh, outsource services, because regulation is a necessary evil, it's going to happen. So you need to find a way to, you know, work within the regulation. So I think opportunities exist for compliance companies, uh, for tools, um, app application providers, um, and merchants, you know, companies like BitPay that go out there and sign up merchants. We need a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're an entrepreneur and want to get into this business, those are the opportunities I see you should be looking at. Great. Thank you, Bill. Cool. Yeah. Um, thinking about this in terms of the international focus of the panel, I, I think uh, while I think the consumer applications that we all know about are interesting, sexy, you know, kind of fun, I see the real opportunities more from a business to business perspective, especially internationally. Um, you know, I, I can speak for myself. If there was a company that could help us basically manage reserves and hedge, you know, the same way that oil and gas companies do at a massive scale, but we can do that, uh, you know, using Bitcoin, that would be super interesting. That could save us potentially a lot of money, like I said, which we would pass on to the consumer. So I, I, I see a lot of opportunity in the business to business area for basically managing the kind of payments that Charlie was talking about for large businesses, using the examples uh, for Roger's company, managing reserve currencies, being able to, to hedge, you know, like I said, in, in, in large multinational businesses uh, where, where dollar is, is uh, becoming riskier and riskier over time. Uh, but it really is the only viable opportunity today. I think it's going to take a long time for those things to evolve. 
uh, and you know, kind of consumer applications and the gambling and things like that that are driving a lot of the adoption now, um, you know, are probably easier to sell. Uh, but I do think that the value of those business-to-business -business applications over time is significantly higher. And so I think that's a real opportunity. Great. Thank you. Jay. Yeah, I, I would agree that the business-to-business -business tools and, and mechanisms are very important. And to that end, one thing that we have seen in the Bitcoin market right now, uh, at least historically, is a lack of exchange dominance. Uh, we have one exchange that takes the entire world's money basically. They are not in the U.S. They are not legally licensed in the U.S. And we don't really have a lot of exchanges out there that the market can actually utilize. So I, I think probably the biggest growth sector in the next couple years is going to be large financial institutions that are coming in and looking at the Bitcoin market and saying to themselves, nobody can actually do exchange legally here. So that business-to-business -business integration where there is an exchange in the U.S. that can support this growing economy is probably going to be our greatest growth sector. Yeah, wait until the SEC inserts themselves into the exchange process in the United States. It's going to be crazy. That's going to be a lot of fun. Well, no, I agree with Jay on that. I agree with Jay that uh, exchange, but to broaden it, infrastructure. Um, a lot of, we just need a lot more infrastructure. We need a lot more entrepreneurs, a lot more people building products, anything what it is, just keep trying and failing, trying and failing. And trying you'll and succeed. succeeding. Trying <laughs> and succeeding, for sure. But it's gonna, you know, it takes, mistakes happen and you gotta keep getting back on that horse. But at the same time, um, a lot of people were saying, well, look at the Bitcoin bubbles that happened, which I don't believe are bubbles, but that's another conversation. But look at all this and I say, hey, look, even if 95% of people were just people speculating and, and just don't even care enough about it. That means that we have 5% of new entrepreneurs in the Bitcoin space, and that's what we need, is new infrastructure. Great, thanks, Johnny. I'd like to open up questions from the floor. If you guys just line up in the microphone, thanks. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Charles Evans. I teach finance at Florida Atlantic University, which several of you have heard me say today. Um, one thing that I want to point out is um, I'm a veteran of uh, .com 1.0. Uh, I was involved with several online payment systems back then, and our industry fell off the edge of the earth after the Patriot Act was passed. So I dusted off my graduate degree, and now I'm doing this right now, but I smell the ozone on the air, and I hear the call of the wild, and I spent my hard-earned money to come out here and be with you folks. One thing that I can tell you is that one of the major differences between what we're seeing now and what we were doing back in our day um, is a realization that you need to make nice with the regulators. Uh, obviously, we're not terribly pleased about that, but that's okay. But the point is that there's a much greater realism here that, and a much greater level of, I would call it, maturity than what we saw back in our day when we were spitting in the eye of Leviathan and thinking that we were going to take down the nation state with our server-based services that were one subpoena and one crazy CEO away from failure. So um, what I can say is um, we're all on the right track, and yes, we should be aware of the regulators, but I wouldn't spend too much time looking for monsters under the bed. I feel like one of those blues musicians from the 1930s listening to the Rolling Stones getting rich off my music. That's what I see. You know, we were, we were all scratchy and we, we were making scratchy music back in our day and now you guys are like, you know, rock stars. Um, uh, thanks. No, I'm serious. <laughs> and, Do you have any specific question that you want to My kids would disagree with you, by the way. Just That's to be fine. Clear. Yeah. Uh, it was actually more just a, just a major group hug and pat on the back because I keep hearing the same themes over and over. And uh, so I don't have any questions per se other than why don't you just accept the fact that we're going to have to deal with regulators and get on with starting businesses, which seems well, we to be... Well, we are. I know. I mean, people I know, are doing and, that. And, and that's what's so brilliant about it this time. A little more optimism. Uh, awesome. Uh, you're, you're definitely on the right track. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to actually ask a question. Speaking of all this uh, international business that uh, you would love to be done, what would you pick from each jurisdiction, the best measures that um, are friendly to Bitcoin? Or if you could um, design a do-it-yourself jurisdiction, how would you make that? What sort of uh, laws or lack of laws would you like to see there? 
Don't put me in power. That's <laughs> <laughs> a bad idea. So, so the question is, how would you design an environment that would be conducive to the innovation? So, um, you know, anyone like to take that, or I, I can? I speak to FinCEN all the time about this. Uh -huh. uh, you know, what we need here is the same e-money regulation that we have in Europe. Uh, you have one level playing field. They're just not interested. I mean, no. you know, uh, FinCEN, uh, BSA overseers, Treasury, they are not sitting around trying to figure out how to regulate Bitcoin. Let's not be delusional about it. We're sitting yep. in a trillion dollar economy. Uh, you know, they have a lot to do, a lot bigger things to worry about than Bitcoin. It's going to get to the point where it's big enough where they do have to worry about it. The guidance was a very, very small first step. Mm. Uh, but they're, they're just not interested in e-money regulation right now because it, 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 it adds no value to them, right? It's much easier for them to let the 48 states go do what they're going to do, and they're not going to change that perspective Why anytime not? soon. I like the idea of uniforming I, the 48 states. Oh, I agree. I've been, I've been hammering yeah. them on that for five years. They're just not interested. Why not, though? Because they don't see the value in it. I see the value in it. I do too. That's why I've been hammering the mic for five years. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually, I think uh, I wasn't here yesterday, but I heard that uh, the association, the foundation, is looking at hiring lobbyists to yeah. to go out there and promote that. So I think that's a really good sign of maturity in the in the market. And by the way, I, I solved the problem that you're talking about by actually issuing via a credit union. We stopped our, our money transmitter businesses altogether and said, okay, what's the socially responsible way to do this that, that doesn't skirt the regulation but avoids me having to go to 48 states at the time, 44 states, to get licenses? And a credit union was the only answer. So there are ways to do it if you, you know. It's a route I'm actually trying to go for, but I, it's difficult to start a credit union or to work with a credit union. They have a lot of risk as well. Yeah. I have to go after, I have 30 money transmitter licenses in, in 30 states, but it's, it's so difficult. The other 17, like California and New York, are yeah. almost impossible to get. Yeah. We'll I, talk I later. think it's, the, it's actual, the actual question is, in your ideal world, what oh, would be the regulatory the environment? And uh, myself personally, and I think a lot of their very early Bitcoin adopters are of the voluntary spent. And that means that we think that all human interactions should be on a voluntary basis. And look around, and anytime you see one group of people imposing force upon another group of peaceful people, we should be opposed to that. And if you look at what's going on with the regulators, it's one group of people telling another group of people what they are or are not allowed to do. And if they don't obey this first group of people, they'll be locked in a cage. And I think philosophically, we should be opposed to that. From a business standpoint, though, regulation from on Bitcoin is one of the best things that we can have happen because all these venture capital guys are going to come in, all these businesses are going to be built, and lots of things are going to happen. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it's morally wrong for one group of people to threaten violence against another piece, a group of people for engaging in consensual acts. So yeah, that's Veer. my view. Yeah. Roger Veer for president Thank 2016. You. By the way, you can go, I don't, isn't Peter Thiel trying to build a utopian society, libertarian society? Blue on seed, yeah. That's what Blue he's seed. working on. Okay, there you go. So how, you make your own laws and then tell us what you did. <laughs> there you go. Good. Hi, my name is Alan Wool and I'm CEO of Go Gorilla Advertising. We're a New York-based advertising company. About 15 years ago, we introduced a product where we can uh, offer our clients the ability to advertise on money. And what we did was we... Uh, took stickers and we put them on dollar bills and then we then sold the dollar bills at a discount to venues like nightclubs who would then put them in their cash registers and give them out as change. And we've done that for about 40 different advertisers over the past 15 years. And my question is, do any of you see a way to use, uh, to introduce advertising into the Bitcoin network? Look at colored coins. I think uh, Yossi from uh, eToro is working on something like that. What I was going to say is we absolutely see that today. For example, with Satoshi Dice. When you see a Satoshi Dice address, that's advertising in action. And that's right there in the network. All of his addresses start with one dice. So mm -hmm. any, when you look on the blockchain, you see every single transaction is Satoshi Dice. And what you also see is a lot of people generating their own public keys with vanity addressing. So they'll put their name, they'll put their company name, things like that. And uh, there are many, many ways that we can integrate advertising into the protocol itself. Is that legal what you did though? Yeah, I think it was um, the same it's question. actually defacing money. Yeah, it, it sounds part. peaceful to me. The stickers, the stickers are removable. We don't need your name. Just the stickers are removable, like post-it notes, okay. oh, okay. so it doesn't leave any residue on okay. the on the money. But I, I always get asked that question, and, and I'm still out of jail, so it seems to be working. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll edit you. your you. description out of the YouTube version of the video. Hello. Um, 
I'm, I guess, asking a question somewhat about exchanges. I don't know if you're aware, but there are people, I guess, exchanging bitcoins in Union Square in New York City. Um, I guess yeah, I'm Josh is ro working on that. Josh yeah. Rossi. Do you think this type of concept of live exchange could um, both get some Wall Street attention and maybe put some regulators at bay? It'll do the opposite, I think. It's not going to put any regulators at bay. It's going to poke the bear mm -hmm. if we start trying to do circumventing type activities like that. Um, if we avoid the regulations by skirting around them and sort of doing things that are morally gray or legally gray, that'll just piss the regulators off and they're going to come stomp on us. You look at a site like localbitcoins.com, I think they're doing an amazing job. Um, like you can essentially the Craigslist of buying and selling bitcoins, but it's also like super scary because that kind of give us a negative, negative connotation in the eyes of the regulators and governments. But we'll see. It all remains to be seen. You don't know. Bitcoin is so new still. We're still in beta. We're not even at version one. Okay. Great. So I think we've, how much time do we have? I think we have about five minutes left. I'm going to pose another question to the panel. Um, so when we look at exchange rates across different countries and, and you know, the, the rand versus the, the dollar, pound, euro, they all trade at different prices to the, to the Bitcoin. And, and, and there is some sort of arbitrage because they're trading against each other as well. But over the long term, how relevant is it to have, um, or how important is it to have these cross-currency trading? And do you think that there's an opportunity for a global currency? I, I know you have to get to the point where people are paying the employees in, in bitcoins, and you know the, and the entire supply chain has to adopt bitcoin. But do you think we can get to a point where there's, uh, without having sort of uh, political union, having fiscal union across the world, a single currency? I don't know if that's going to viably happen, just because people are greedy. And you can go on the Forex markets and you can trade at leverage and make a lot of money very quickly if you know what you're doing. Um, so to that end, all those people that are trading on leverage and making a lot of money on the markets, they're not going to want a unified currency. I and think, sorry, I, don't know. I, I was going to say that I, I think that it can definitely be a valuable currency pair in terms of um, multi-pair arbitrage and, and various things like that, but I don't think it'll be the single currency. In, uh, in some religions, uh, a unified global currency is like the sign of the coming of like the end of times. So I, <laughs> there's a little bit of a worry there. Whew. Glad the euro crashed. So <laughs> the <laughs> the uh, global FX market is about four trillion dollars a day. It's a huge market. Uh, granted, most of that is uh, whole, uh, wholesale, bank to bank, and government and so forth. But still, it's a huge market. And companies like FXCM or other global um, FX trading brokerage companies uh, are looking at Bitcoin, I'm sure, uh, very closely. And you talked about biggest losers or winners. I think there is an opportunity. They look at this as a currency. When it becomes a you know, much more uh, viable option, they, they, they may want to enter this market and arbitrage that with, you know, so you can trade currency like with Bitcoin as you do with any other currency you know, through their uh, platform. So um, I see that's an opportunity for um, that p potentially could, ex you know, once market gets a lot bigger. Right now we do, I think, 45, 50 million dollars a day. So it's a drop in the bucket. But um, as it gets bigger, this, uh, it could open this up. And I think the Security Exchange Commission is looking at pot potentially regulating this. So um, it could open the market to those larger global partners that have, you know, tens of thousands of employees and have offices everywhere and they can easily help uh, doing the currency conversion. So if you look at the, the when you talk about the market, the, you know, everyone says the Bitcoin market. The market doesn't change in size by more than 25 coins every 10 minutes. That's, that's the market size. What's really driving the market is the value of the Bitcoin. The market right? cap. Yeah, the market the cap, value right. of So the value of the Bitcoin. So as the price is going to increase over time, so like in my mind, personally, I'm very happy with the current price. I wanted to stay this low as long as possible. So firstly, I can accumulate lots He's of points. He's hoarding. I'm hoarding. <laughs> but, but secondly, I think a stable, a stable currency is good for, for entrepreneurs in the space. Uh, it gives us time to build out the business, build out the systems. Uh, it's great for staying out of you know, the regulatory eye. You know, right now, it's a small $1.5 billion economy. No one's paying attention. When Bitcoin gets to $1,000 plus a coin, we're not going to have that luxury. And you're going to have every single major company trying to figure out. Like, it, it almost happened, right? When we hit 266, it almost happened. It was like, oh my goodness, this thing's going to 1,000. Everyone's spinning their tails. And then it crashed. Like, whew, 
you know, and all the execs in these companies didn't have to worry about it anymore. Yes. So as a community, I, I, I'm selfishly waiting for keeping it low and stable as long as possible. So when you talk about the market getting big enough, when is that going to happen? And when can when anyone have any guesses when you expect to get to the thousand dollar Bitcoin? Well, in about three months. No, I, I, I don't think anybody <laughs> can predict that. I think uh, what you. Uh, uh, that's the last question. So okay, two and a half months. months. What's your okay, Roger? Sorry, Roger again. What's your prediction at the end of this year for the Bitcoin price? <laughs> and, and I have to answer the question first too. Um, I agree with Roger. Everything he says. <laughs> uh, it, it'll be whatever the market decides. Yeah, it's cool. uh, which That's is a cop out. I want to open up my laptop. Which is the cop out answer? But I'll, I'll give you my my honest guess. Uh, I think it's definitely going to be higher because of all of the people that are attending this conference, and they're going to he hear about it, and they're going to tell their friends about it. All the media that's going to be generated. Um, I. If I had to bet money, I would bet money that it'll be over the high. It'll be at a new high. It'll be higher than the two hundred and sixty-six dollars it hit just recently. So will it break a thousand this year? If I had to get fifty-fifty odds, I would. I would bet that it will. It's not so. going to go straight to a thousand. What's going to happen is you're going to have benchmarks, and that's what we see in it's Bitcoin. It's like success is on entrepreneurs. Yeah. It's on a straight you know, line up. It's it goes like from yeah. two hundred and sixty <laughs> back to a hundred, and then it goes. It'll go from like a hundred to. 350 and then back yeah, to 260. I'm, I'm asking what the spot price is December 31st. Well, I think there's two aspects of Bitcoin. There's a commodity aspect and there's a currency aspect. I'm really more interested in the current currency aspect. Yeah, yeah, that's not the question. <laughs> we've, got, we've got time constraints. Give us a number. Yeah. Come on, I need Alan. a number now. Yeah. If, okay, I'll leave you uh, food for thought. Uh, if, <laughs> if Bitcoin, number. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll give you an answer. If Bitcoin get, captures point, let's say one basis point of the global FX trading, we, uh, it would hit not only a thousand, but much higher than a thousand. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay, so, <laughs> so you say more than a thousand? But as far as timing of it, I don't know. It's no, we're, we're talking about a six, on six month window, seven month window. Yeah, I'm buying a lot of Bitcoins right now, so that should okay, be. I you. believe you. Okay, yeah. let's move to Bill. <laughs> so first, I would say if, bit, if Bitcoin hits a thousand dollars, nothing changes in terms of regulatory oversight. I mean, a ten billion dollar economy versus a billion dollar economy okay. on a global basis, federated across 150 countries. Nothing's going to no change. Okay. Where the price is at the end of the year, I have no idea. It doesn't really interest me, and I, have, you know, I would I would guess it's going to go higher, but I honestly have no idea. Okay, uh, Jay. Higher than a dollar. Yeah. Would be my best guess, but realistically, I think we're going to be doing pretty well. Um, you look at the exchange marketplace out there, and we're seeing some really innovative things. So various exchanges, whether new upstart exchanges or previously existing exchanges, are all looking at OFX and the FIX protocol, which is what foreign exchanges use to, to conduct their FX trades. And uh, as soon as we're going to be able to integrate the OFX protocol, I think we're going to see a major rally. Yeah, because things like MetaTrader and uh, all of these trading platforms out there that use OFX are going to instantly be able to plug into Mt. Gox, Bitstamp, whoever. Um, and once we see that, uh, I think the market is going to rally. And whether we see it in the next seven months, who knows? But I think we'll do fine. January 1st, 2014. At exactly midnight, the price is going to be four hundred and sixty-seven dollars and forty-three cents. Someone write this down. <laughs> so I'll give mine as a last point. Uh, a, I actually we actually have a question. I oh, think. sorry, sorry. Yeah, a question. You want to ask a question? I almost forgot what I was going to ask. My, my name is James Lauer. I'm a Bitcoin miner and speculator. Um, MoneyGram, Western Union, other large financial institutions that already have a strong regulatory compliance in the team um, could easily once they realize that we've reached critical mass, step into the market. Do you anticipate that such organizations, when they do make the seemingly inevitable decision, if all of what's happening here goes the way it should, to have a ramp up period where they purchase and acquire Bitcoins prior to announcing their entry into the market? Yes. If so, has it already happened? Yes. Yes. And what are the signs that it is happening? What yes. are the signs that it's accelerating? And what should we look for as speculators, miners, and investors? so that we can time the market. Buy walls. Buy walls. Buy walls. You look at the order books, that's the beauty of exchanges yeah. is that you can read their order books and if you don't need to be a financial al a a sorry, you don't need to be a financial analyst to see what uh, what the trades are and how to read the buy and sell charts and just look at like mountgoxlive.com and things like that. They've also moved to hidden orders now a lot more recently in the past few weeks. So I, I'd say the chances that at least a couple of governments are buying bitcoins in some degree yeah. uh, are probably 100%.
Yeah. Yep. I, just, I couldn't say who they are, but there's 200 governments out there. So Dark pools, yeah. too. I mean, I get uh-huh. this guy calls me up, and he's like, I represent this small island north of, like, um, south of the Solomon Islands, and he just declared sovereignty from Papua New Guinea, and he's trying to make Bitcoin. It's like sovereign currency in this island. I think that's the best idea ever. There are no I was hoping there. Iceland would do that. Like, I can't get there physically. <laughs> I have to take like six boats. Okay. So my prediction, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be out there and tell, I'm going to say 1st of January 2014, uh, $1,000 price plus. So let's see what happens. See you guys next year. Cheers. Thanks. Bill, do you have a part? I agree.